Okay, so that constant is not 1 over c, that's 1. There will be the other constant that will be 1 over c. So at least now we know how to measure them. Since k, we just chose it to be 1, so that the unit of the magnetic field is equal to the unit of the electric field. And we can just set that constant to 1 by just redefining what we call the magnetic induction. So we just set it to 1. And if they are both equal to 1, well, this m over b, we just relate it to observable quantities, which is r0 and theta. There's no k, k is 1. m times b is just the moment of inertia and omega. So we, are, we can actually measure the dipole moment of a given dipole and the magnetic field in a given, at a given point. So we are not talking about, let's say, ghosts, things that we cannot measure. These are actual things that we can actually measure. Now, of course, then the problem is, OK, so we define them. Uh, we should study what is exerting these, uh, what's creating these magnetic fields, and what is exerting the torques. What are the forces created by these magnetic fields? Of course, that is many experimentation, etc. So it turns out that, let's say, you have an infinite wire that is carrying, let's say, a current I along the wire. And you are looking at the magnetic field at this point, at the point R. Well, you take a segment of this wire at the point R prime. And you define this uh, very small vector, dl. And then this, there will be a contribution. Well, let's say this is the direction. Yeah. The contribution to the magnetic field from that very small segment, it just turns out to be dB is equal to I times dl cross and, uh, dl cross r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime cube with some proportionality constant. Now let's try to find this proportionality constant. Let's first try to determine the dimension of this proportionality constant. <coughs> now, the unit of B is equal to unit of this K. This is, different K. this is a different K. Times the unit of I, which is the unit of charge per unit of time. Times unit of DL divided by the unit of length squared. Now, what is the unit of Q over L squared? Unit of electric field. Unit of the magnetic field is K L over T times this unit of the electric field. But we had chosen, we had defined our magnetic induction such that it has the same unit as the electric field. So this K should have the unit of 1 over L over T, or 1 over the, some, some kind of a velocity. And we just denote that velocity, that, that speed, C. So K, we just call it 1 over C. C having some unit of length of speed. And this C will turn out to have the unit of uh, the speed of light. So this is the, the uh, magnetic induction created by a charge unit charge carrier. <laughs> now this, this is for a current running on a, on a wire. Now the current I uh, we define it as the total charge that passes through a given point in a unit amount of time. So if you just have, look, consider this point over here, 
count how many charges passes that point in a time dt. So that amount of time is dq. If you just take the ratio, that is your current. This is not a derivative, by the way. Although it looks like a derivative, this is not actually the derivative of q because there is no function q. We don't define a function q in this case. It's just we just count the charges. That is our dq. We measure the time, and we just divide those two measurements. Now, I'm stressing this because if you remember in the beginning, I said that statics means that there is no change in time. So the time derivatives will disappear. They will all be 0. But in this case, dq by dt is not the time derivative. So that's why it need not be 0. This is how we define i. Now, usually, of course, we don't have what uh, the wire, we don't have these uh, lines in, in real life. The, every the wire has a finite thickness, etc. So if you just consider a wire, so when we this it's carrying a current I, what we usually define is the current density J, and J is defined as I di by dA. So what you do is the currents are running in, your, in our system. This is how the, ch the <coughs> charges are moving. So you just take an area which is perpendicular to this current. And you uh, measure how, what is the current running through it, through this area. You divide it by the area. So that is your, uh, the magnitude of the current density. And the current density vector is defined as j uh, times, let's say, dA hat. Let me just use this notation. So you see we have this current particles are running. We just take a, a, an area which is perpendicular to it, dA. This is dA. This J is in the direction of this dA. So that's why I have this a, dA hat over there. So And the magnitude is determined by, you have this area, you measure the current running through it and you divide the current by the area, that is your current density. Or you can also write it as dq by dt times dA. And in terms of this current density, you can always define the, the total current running through a, a larger area, not an infinitesimal area. This will be just J scalar product with dA. This is how we can relate the current density to the current running through a given, the total current running through our system. Now, for a moment, let's relax the condition of uh, statics. Let's just assume we have some volume. In this volume, we have some charge total charge Q, and Q will be, of course, the integral of rho, or which can be a function of time now, if you relax the condition of being time in the, the <coughs> statics, d cubed r. Well, if the charge is decreasing in this volume, well, if charge is conserved, this charge, if it is changing in time, it is because of a current running through the boundary of this volume. But that the total current passing through our surface would be just J dot dA. Let's say this is our dA. Remember, J is kind of the charge per unit time per unit area. So if I multiply by area, it is the charge per unit time. It is the charge per charge passing through our area per unit time. So if the total charge inside my volume is decreasing, then the total charge passing my surface area in the direction of the area should be equal to the rate of change of the total charge with a minus sign, because dq, of the, dq by dt is decreasing. Now, I know what q is. Is the rho r t t cubed r. 
But this, if I just move the total time, the time derivative inside, now it becomes a partial time derivative if I move the time derivative inside because the integral doesn't depend on point the position. So the only argument is time. It's the only variable. But when I move it inside, the, char the charge density depends on both the position and the time. And this should be equal to minus j dot dA, but this is nothing but minus the divergence of j times d cubed r over, my vol over the same volume. This is the boundary of my volume. This is over the volume. Or I can just combine them, just combine them in the, on the same side, d rho by dt plus the divergence of j d cubed r, this should be equal to zero. But you see, this was the volume that I started with was kind of arbitrary. I just had a region of space which had some charge density. I assumed an arbitrary volume. and I looked at the total charge in this volume. I know that the charge is conserved locally. There's local charge conservation in the sense that, for example, if you just uh, take one charge over here, put it instantaneously at the other end, at the other class, the charge is still conserved. But we know that this doesn't happen. If you take some charge over here, it should move to the other class. So it's not just charge is conserved, the charge is locally conserved. So if the charge in this volume is decreasing, that is because charge is moving out of this volume. Now that local conservation of charge is, it just basically means that this quantity is equal to zero, that local conservation at every point. This is called the continuity equation. And what else we can say in statics? d rho by dt is equal to zero. So this current density should be divergenceless. Okay, this is one thing we know about this J, the current density. Now let's go back. Now any questions in this derivation? So if we had this volume, if the charge in this volume is decreasing, it means there is a positive uh, current running through, the, through my area. This argument on this page, starting from here, is general. Whether the, the, you have a static case or not, it doesn't matter. This result is valid in the static case, in the non-static case. In our case, we will be using, eventually, the divergence of J is equal to zero. It just basically states that there is no accumulation of charge anywhere. Now let's get this one. Well, from here we can say that B is equal to K times integral, this K is one over C. One over C times I DL cross R minus R prime divided by R minus R prime cube. Well, let's, let's just consider a region of space where we have some j. It's not just an infinitely thin wire, but some charge distribution. Now what we can do is we can just consider this as a collection of many infinitesimal wires. So we can just imagine this segment, which has a cross section, let's say dA. 
then I in this case will be just J times dA. Furthermore, the dL will be in the direction of J. So I times dL, this is a vector on the left hand side, this will be equal to J times dA times dL. So I just I am just assuming a very small segment over here. This is my dL. It is a cross section dA. So for that very small segment, I times dL is just J times dA. We have dI. Huh? We have dI. Yeah, if you like dI. But you see, J and dL, they are both pointing in the same direction. So this is equal to J dA times dL. Because the two vectors on the left and the right, they have the same magnitude, they are pointing in the same direction, so they have to be identical. So this tells me that B will be equal to 1 over C. Well, I'm integrating over each one of these lines Furthermore, I'm summing over all these lines. That is, I kind of, I'm summing over all these possible dA's. But that is, I'm integrating over the whole volume. dV j cross r minus r prime over r minus r prime q. Now, if we have a bunch of charges moving, let's say a single point charge, then J will be equal to, well, let's, let's look at some other example. That is where I will be heading. What is the J for a point charge moving from velocity V? And I will claim that J for such a case will be Q V Dirac delta R minus R zero. Let's see if this is the case. Well that Dirac delta I think is kind of obvious that if R is not equal to R zero, there's no moving charges. So there's no point in talking about uh, current density, the current density will be zero unless we are looking at the position of the charge. Now let's look at, let's see, oh. let me take such an area and let's consider it for a time dt such that this length over here for a long time T. What is the charge that passes through it? The charge just go pass through it in this time T. Hmm? The, the Q has passed. So we defined. Now maybe this is not such a great idea. Let's let's do a different way. Let's look at our line charge. This will be easier. Now, to define the current, what we did was we just chose this point, waited a time dt, counted the number of charges that passed through it. So the charges are moving with, let's say, velocity v. In this time dt, all the charges within this segment dl, where dl is equal to v dt, will pass through that point. So dq, the total charge that passes, is just v dt times rho. I is dq by dt, which is v rho dt divided by dt rho times v. Well, in fact, this is, you, I mean, this is for rho here is the linear charge density. In general, j will be rho times v. Huh? 
here rho is linear charge density of moving charges here rho is the volume charge density for a point charge rho is just q times Dirac delta r minus r0 so for a point charge if we just put it over here B is equal to 1 over C dV J is Q V0 times Dirac delta R minus R0 R0 being the position of my charge cross R minus R prime divided by R minus R prime Q I can take the volume integral this is equal to 1 over C Q times V0 R minus R prime uh, R0 now I'm integrating over prime prime coordinates by the way J this is R prime R minus R0 divided by R minus R0 cube which is V0 cross V0 over C cross Q times R minus R0 divided by R minus R0 cube what is that quantity in parentheses? electric field so the magnetic field is equal to V0 over C cross the electric field for a point charge this is nice but not correct there is one thing we missed kind of, I mean everything is because of time You see, this is the problem. Now we started by using an expression that is valid in magnetostatics. We used it in a case which is not magnetostatics. This is a good approximation. We will see that at least if the charge is moving slowly, it is almost statics, then this would be correct. This, this expression is correct for small speeds, small compared to C. But there are corrections to it. Well, let's say it, is, it will be kind of funny because this is approximately correct, but this is correct for a charge that is moving at constant velocity. This is correct if V0 is constant. Not constant speed, constant velocity. If V0 is not constant, even that is not really correct. Let's play with this expression a bit. Just like we did in the electric field case. <coughs> you see, this, is, this was equal to the gradient with respect to R of 1 over R minus R prime 
or it was minus the, now here we have a minus, this is plus the gradient with respect to r prime of 1 over r minus r prime. So the b at the point r is 1 over c dv prime j r prime cross the gradient with respect to r prime of 1 over r minus r prime. Now I will do, I will do an integration by part. Yeah, that is, I would like to do an integration by part. This will be equal to dv prime curl of j of r prime divided by r minus r prime this is the curl with respect to r prime minus Am I doing it right? So let us just do it in a different form. Now I couldn't remember the vector expression. Bi, the i component, will be 1 over c epsilon i j k dv prime j j at r prime times del over del x k prime of 1 over r minus r prime which is equal to 1 over c epsilon i j k dv prime del over del x k prime j j of r prime 1 over r minus r prime minus 1 over r minus r prime del over del x k prime j j of r prime or b is equal to 1 over c dv prime now this is minus the curl of j times 1 over r minus r prime and plus curl of j over r minus r prime plus what do we have the curl of j with respect to r prime divided by r minus r prime uh, actually this is not what I want let me restart I want to use this one, the minus sign, is what I prefer. This is the gradient with respect to r. So this is what we have. This is equal to 1 over c dv prime j of r prime curl the gradient with respect to r of 1 over r minus r prime well that gradient with, res with a minus sign that gradient with respect to r I can just take it out so this will be equal to minus 1 over c times the plus the curl of dv prime of j of r prime divided by r minus r prime why, where did the minus sign go? I switched the order. The derivative, the j was first and the, the derivative was second, but in the final expression, the derivative is first and the, the j is the second. So that brings that minus sign. 
So let's just call this A. And hence B is equal to the curl of A. So it's in the, it's, it just likes the electrostatic potential in the sense that instead of the electric field, it's enough to know the electrostatic potential. In this case, it's, uh, it's not the, I mean, if we know this A, which is called the vector potential, we know B. But it also tells us one more thing. The divergence of B is always zero. So this is one of our new equations. Let's calculate the curl of B also. There I will be needing the other one. So B is equal to dV j dV prime. Let me just call it j prime is at the point r prime cross r minus r prime divided by r minus r prime cube. Now the curl of B is equal to 1 over C dV prime. The curl of j prime times r minus r prime. You see, this curl is with respect to the coordinate r. Now let us try to simplify it a bit. Let's write the I component. This will be equal to 1 over C dV prime, the curl of J prime cross, let, let's, let me just call it RR, F of R minus R prime. I just don't want to write this one over r minus r prime cubed all the time. And of course, I need to take the i, comp I component of all of this thing, which is equal to epsilon i j k, or let me just look at the integrand. Curl of j prime cross f, the i component. This is equal to epsilon i j k del over del x j times j prime cross f k which is equal to epsilon i j k del over del x j epsilon k l m j prime l f m now I have this product of two Kronecker deltas that will be equal to zero unless i is equal to l and j is equal to m or i is equal to m and j is equal to l. Del over del x, uh, x j, j l prime f m. So which is equal to J, uh, J prime I divergence of F minus J prime that the gradient acting on F. You see, the first term 
tells me that L should be I, so that is where I get the J prime I, and L, uh, J and M, they should be equal, so if M is the M component of this F vector, and I'm taking the M, uh, it's J's derivative, with respect to its derivative with respect to xj, j and m should be equal, so I'm taking the j component with respect to, like, taking the derivative of j component with respect to xj and summing over all j, so that gives me the divergence. Now what is the divergence of f? You see, this is our f. Hmm? It's a direct delta. So this is equal to j i prime, so there's no dot over here, 4 pi times the Dirac delta of r minus r prime minus j prime that the divergent, that the gradient operator f i. Now let's go back, the curl of b. This is 1 over c times the integral of this expression. So it is dv prime j prime j at the point r 4 pi times the Dirac delta 3 of r minus r prime minus 1 over c dv prime j at the point r prime scalar product with gradient with respect to r times r minus r prime over r minus r prime cube. Now the first term is nice. So the curl of b is equal to 4 pi over c times the current at the point r. This is the curl of b at the point r. Plus 1 over c dv prime j of r prime, the divergence with respect to r prime it was a, the gradient operator with respect to r but I just changed it into r prime but the derivative of that r minus r prime over r minus r prime cube with respect to r is minus its derivative with respect to r prime so that's why I just I convert it into R prime and also add that minus sign. So minus 1 over C just became 1 over, plus 1 over C. Now I will do an integration by part over in the second term. That is what I'm looking for. Now if I do an integration by part over there, dv prime, j of R prime that the divergence with respect to r prime of this expression, this will be equal to dv prime, the divergence of j prime, uh, no, let's, let's see. Okay, let me do it the long way. Let, let us look at the i component of this thing, which is dv prime j of r prime, j prime uh, that gradient with respect to r prime of fi, which is equal to dv prime, the divergence of j prime fi minus the divergence of j with respect to r prime, of course, of j prime times fi.
I just wrote everything in under the same derivative, that is the first term minus, I just subtracted out the derivative of j prime. Now what is the divergence of j prime? Zero, because we are in magnetostatics. This is zero. Well, the first term, I can just convert it into a surface integral. I can, I mean, the my volume is infinite. I'm taking into account all the charges since I'm calculating total magnetic field, all the currents. My volume is infinite, so my surface is at infinity. So the first term, when I convert it into a surface integral, it's also zero. So the second term over here in the curl of B, the second term is zero. So I'm left with the first one. So we already had seen that the divergence of B is equal to zero, mainly because B can be written as the curl of A. And the curl of B is equal to 4 pi over C times J. So these are the two equations that my mag the magnetic induction satisfies. So where is mu zero? No, mu zero doesn't exist here. It's a different unit. Just like in the study of electrostatics, there is no epsilon zero in our units. There is no mu zero here. Yeah, because we are using the Gaussian units. In SI units, we have the epsilon zero, we have the mu zero, their product under the square root is one over C. But that is in SI. Now on Wednesday, we will just proceed with the force that this magnetic field creates. We will study the force, and then so we basically know everything about this magnetic induction, about this B field, it's, uh, how it's created, how it exerts force on other, meter, other objects, and then the rest will be applications. Questions? Okay. Well, you see, it's the grade. So just look at it. It's the derivative of one over r. It's a vector, but it is take the vector product is taking with respect to j. So let's just take it out and let me show it explicitly. So this is B. So Bi is minus 1 over C epsilon i j k dv prime j prime uh, j del over del x k 1 over r minus r prime, which is equal to minus 1 over C epsilon i j k del over del x k dv prime let me remove this vector sign, j prime j over r minus r prime. This is what I call 
uh, AJ. The J component of A. This is minus one over C. Well, let me also change the indices K and J in the Levi-Civita. So it is epsilon I K J del over del X K times A J. No, sorry, this is C times A J. And you see, it's already a curl. So you see, this gradient, you are right, it is the gradient of the scalar function. But you see, we have this cross product. So that is basically what converts this expression, this gradient, into a cross product over here. Okay, so see you on Friday. <laughs>